My name's Craig McLaren. Uh, I'm the director for Scotland and Ireland in, in the Royal Town Planning Institute, and I have the absolute pleasure today to have been asked to uh, to chair this, today's discussion on the big planning issue, which is impacting on planners up and down the world uh, and, and across the globe uh, around the COVID-19 um, pandemic, which is which is happening. Um, I will be asking the the chief executives from all the uh, global planning network partners uh, about how planners in, in, in their country are supporting a green recovery uh, as part of the post-COVID recovery plans. And are we asking them to do this within within a two minute period? So something short, something succinct to give you a flavour of what's been going on. Uh, I'm going to be joined by David Williams from the Planning Institute Australia, um, by um, Beth McMahon from the Canadian Institute of Planners, uh, by Martin Lewis from the South African Council for Planners, by Joel Albizo from the American Planning Association and Victoria Hills from the Royal Town Planning Institute in the UK. So I'm going to kick off with you, David, um, from, from Australia. I'm just wondering, what, what's the situation been like in Australia and, and how have your members and society in general tried to cope with the COVID-19 uh, a pandemic and try to move towards this this green economy ambition. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Craig, and thanks for the invite. Happy to um, have a chat. Um, Australia uh, and the COVID situation comes straight off the back of, uh, of a severe bushfire season that I think mm -hmm. actually made news internationally. So Australia is already feeling the impact of rapid climate change. We've had record breaking heat. You know, high frequency storms, long and savage droughts and bushfires, you know, those bushfires we had last season for long experience, uh, firefighters have never seen anything like what we went through. Uh, back in November, PIA declared a climate and biodiversity emergency and, and we've committed to zero net carbon in the built environment by 2035 and planners playing their part in that. Um, there's other groups of planners in Australia who have self-organised into, you know, to take more strident uh, positions in terms of the projects and the clients they engage with as well. Earlier this year, I described the challenge for planners in Australia to be you know, bushfire recovery, which you know, wiped out uh, great chunks of uh, country right round Australia, um, and then trying to build back better and build back better in the truest sense of that phrase. And then natural hazard planning uh, to strengthen the resilience in our communities. And that plays into the COVID as well. And then like if, as if it was three concentric circles and then climate change, uh, mm -hmm. achieving that zero net in, uh, carbon in the built environment. And then of course, along came COVID. Um, Australia is now battling the second wave, which actually looks to be more severe than the first. But comparatively, we've been able to manage the health impacts um, very well. And um, yeah, we, we're saddened, but we, uh, we measure the, the, the death rate you know, in, in just a couple of hundred. So we've managed that well, but the damage it's done to the economy has been very, very significant. In Australia, when uh, our governments uh, can look at economic recovery, it's one word for them, jobs. It's just, that's how they see it. Um, the Treasury departments at our federal and our state levels talk about shovel-ready projects um, as the ideal economic stimulus pack, uh, tactic, if you like. Um, but we, as a planning profession, we talk about shovel-worthy. Um, and they can be two different things. Um, so a little messy in Australia, but we have a council of uh, the state and federal planning ministers. So the, the ministers are the highest elected officials. And uh, so they come together, all the states, eight states and territories, and the federal minister, and they operate as a council at the moment in this time of emergency. And they've set out six principles to guide the planning decisions in response to both the health and the economic recovery coming out of COVID-19. But and central to those principles is the concept that the public interest is paramount and must remain the key guiding um, decision. But unfortunately, um, none of those six principles um, talk about the environment, less, uh, much less um, climate change. Um, 
So many organisations, many civil society organisations, other organisations in the public and private sector are calling on government to target the green and blue response using the economic stimul uh, stimulation spending. So to get this double outcome, if you like, for that single expenditure. But Australia, as I said, is a federation of eight states and territories, and it's the, ter it's the states and territories that have constitutional power for planning. The yeah. federal government has no power. So we have eight very different planning systems around the country. Um, and those eight systems have to guide 540 odd local governments in their planning decisions. So it's really difficult to get a single green and blue economic recovery agenda running across all those. It mightn't surprise you, but we have vested interests um, with this economic recovery. Um, there are the state and federal politicians who have got an eye to polling and focus groups. We've got vested interests in the development sector. And our treasuries tend to see people as labour units and they see cities as economic engines. And they see nothing do they see through the lens of planners. And so the odds are a bit stacked against us. In fact, they're very stacked against us to get that green and blue led recovery. Um, Nevertheless, uh, the peer, uh, our members and the profession are centred around a call to governments to do four things. Um, stick to the planning principles the ministers have announced. And we want that to flow through, cascade, cascade through all the decisions. Um, make the COVID reforms permanent where they have delivered fast and fair results. So like other countries, many things were swept aside in those early weeks and months um, to get the health response, which was important, and now to get the economic response. We're also saying that planning must join Treasury as the central agencies in the recovery, um, whereas planning tends to be off to the side at the moment. So we're calling for those two to operate in unison, if you like, and then only spend the money in the name of recovery on the things that have a positive legacy. Mm. And that's that shovel worthy concept. Um, one bright spot, as I'll wind up now, one bright spot is the realization during the COVID period that when our government leaders take advice from experts, we can actually get a really good outcome. And we saw that in the health outcomes from COVID. And so the community is now thinking, well, why won't the government leaders take, this, take the expert advice on climate? And why aren't we responding to that in the same manner? So I guess um, in summary, it saddens me, it embarrasses me to report to you that um, whilst the planning profession sought, supports strongly a green and blue recovery, as we call it here, our federal government would probably require a complete ideology transplant to deliver such a recovery, because our treasurer only two weeks ago was um, publicly admiring Thatcher and Reagan. So that can tell you the, a lot about the economic lens that our government is looking through. And um, that green and blue recovery, unfortunately, is, is not being seen through that lens. OK, th th thanks, David. That, that was really interesting. I'm, I'm sure many of us will we'll, we'll recognise the challenges which you face in trying to promote planning as part of the recovery package here. But I'm sure, I'm sure we'll hear more about that as we go, we go further in the discussion. I'm going to move across the Pacific now to, to, to Beth. Uh, so so uh, Beth McMahon from the Canadian Institute of Planners. What's the situation like in Canada and, and what's the response been like from both the Institute and, and your members? Sure, thanks. You know, I'm I'm so I'm kind of excited to follow David in this because I feel like our governance structure is so similar in Canada to Australia, but our political um, party uh, at the federal level is probably about as opposite as as you can get. So, whereas our Minister of Infrastructure and Communities was the former Minister of Environment and Climate Change, so we're seeing that um, yesterday there was a big announcement in terms of new our. Uh, uh, reprioritized infrastructure investment. And it included applying the uh, the funding uh, through a, a climate and equity lens. So those are some of the kind of the counters that we're seeing. Uh, and her parliamentary secretary is actually the 
his name is Andy Fillmore, and he's actually the first elected planner into uh, as a member of parliament. And he announced recently that the federal government would be working on an active transportation strategy. So we're starting to see, you know, um, you know, it's slow. Of course, recovery is going to be slow, but but we are seeing that that at least what the federal government is putting in place is headed in a direction that the Canadian Institute of Planners certainly feels um, familiar with and supportive with. Now, you know, I, it's it's still early stages, and so we haven't seen all of the fine print. Um, you know, we're good at finding things that we would like to see changed, so I'm, I'm sure there's lots of opportunity for improvement, but, uh, but feeling encouraged at this early stage. So it is still very early stage for Canada. Um, you know, everything was, of course, like everywhere else, shut down. Um, we have, you know, pretty strong mask regulations across Canada in place, really trying to uh, mitigate and prevent this second wave, which I'd say has not hit Canada yet. And, uh, and so a lot of the focus, of course, is, you know, in terms of making sure that our communities are as healthy and resilient as we can be. Um, you know, our planners and our members have done an amazing job in adapting to, you know, new ways of consultation. Obviously, they're planning meetings, bringing them online um, and, and in sharing. I mean, really, that's what I've really seen coming out of COVID is, you know, actually the Global Planners Network, we didn't used to have these types of conversations until COVID hit, and now we have them quite regularly. I'm doing the same with my peers across um, the allied professions. So, you know, architecture, landscape architecture, engineering, we're doing the same thing. Um, and certainly with our provincial regulators, we're having much more frequent conversations in terms of sharing information and trying to ensure that we are getting out, you know, the, the most current information to our members as well as best practices. So, you know, when I'm, I know that my members are looking for, you know, Canada's a big country um, and they're looking to see what others are doing and if they can maybe, you know, steal those good ideas and apply them to their own communities. Uh, recently, we saw that in Edmonton, they passed their first um, uh, legislation that um, allowed um, buildings to go up without any minimum parking spaces. That's the first for a big city in Canada. Uh, this was celebrated across the country, of course, led by Edmonton's planning team, because there's a real focus in ensuring that coming out of COVID, we're not a more car dependent society than we already are. Um, you know, my planners are again, you know, they're looking at, I feel like everything through a climate and equity lens, uh, you know, housing and transportation really kind of coming to the top of all of that. In terms of the uh, Institute, we actually last year had said that we committed to developing our own carbon neutrality plan for the Institute. So that work has started uh, and I expect that it'll be completed in the next couple of months. And within that, you know, we're looking at our own greenhouse emissions, um, how to mitigate and reduce those and, and probably how to offset them. You know, I think part of that's going to play into, you know, whether we even go back to a physical office. And I think those are the types of things that, you know, my members are really looking at too. What happens when the economy that used to be so centralized in those downtown cores is not and how to, you know, how to create, um, we talk a lot about the 15 minute community. And that has a, a really important um, lens around kind of climate mitigation in terms of, you know, reducing, you know, emissions for transit and travel. So there's a lot of conversations happening at this point. And I think that there's just a lot of um, sharing and goodwill that we're seeing happening across the country. Uh, and collaboration between the provincial, territorial, and federal levels of government. So at this point, you know, there's, it's still very early stages, but, you know, it, we're happy to, that we're at the point in the conversation that we feel uh, optimism, uh, as optimistic as you can get at this point in time. That's great, Beth. I, I think um, it's uh, it's really interesting to hear the sort of the, the positivity and the potential which you have there. As you say it's, it's early days, but there's potential, and there seems to be a real um, a real feeling that collaboration is a way forward, which I think is something we'd all want to try and uh, pursue as much as we possibly can. I'm going to move quickly on. Um, next up, we've got Martin Lewis from the South African Council for Planners. Martin, how are things playing out in South Africa? And again, what type of things are, are happening? What type of things are you proud of? What type of challenges are you facing? Thank you very much, Craig. Um, yes, South Africa entered the uh, COVID pandemic with evidence of a recession. So that is that is what, what, what we came 
um, out of into into COVID. So we are very st much still in the grips of the COVID pandemic. Um, you would have seen the, the numbers raised in, in South Africa. And the country is still in a lockdown phase with restricted access. And the focus is on basic service delivery and the resuscitation of the economy. From a planning point of view, some local authorities are, are putting in place um, methods to work remotely for applications to be sent in and things like that. Some only functional on a rotational basis, and then there's some that is, that is not functional at all. And the one thing that COVID highlighted is the problems in terms of the green economy. Um, one relate this what one can say that it relates to water provision, and there's some people that still do not have access to prop or proper access to water. Um, government government published uh, or purchased a number of water tanks, but then ran into challenges into into, into erecting them. It also indicated that there is no or, in, or low levels of food security. Um, so that is another crisis that we are sitting with. So the recovery needs to focus on on the on the um, economy and job creation, which involve the informal economy and home-based work. Um, now, if you look at the the planning legislation, um, home-based work is is very often restricted. So we need to have a look at that. Education is another one. We need to catch up on the last year. Um, we busy with uh, um, uh, some research on the impact of of COVID on on the planning education system. And then services, we need to ensure that people have adequate access to housing, basic services and access to employment, social services and amenities. Um, this is not something new. Um, COVID revealed our non-resilience and vulnerability. It exposed us to our inability to address certain aspects. It removed the layer or the cover that we've sometimes put on these issues. It's also exposed the inequality of access, not having a device, not having internet access, not having data. Um, it puts a magnifying glass on the economic differences um, within areas and between areas, quality, inequalities and living conditions. So we need to become more aware of these differences. Um, it has uh, put things that we've put on paper um, through COVID, it has put that up in our face. As planners, we need to look the way that we, we do integrated development planning. We need to look at how do we do spatial development frameworks, land use management. The whole planning system has to be geared up to make us more resilient. We will have to revisit our spatial plans and address the resilience directly and to identify accountability. It cannot just be lip service or the right phrases or the right terminology in plans. We need to actually put action to that. And we need to accept the informal economy and show the importance of our livelihoods to so many people, informal traders, taxis, and there's so many others. Um, COVID shows us where we are the most vulnerable. And if we work together, we can bring transformation post the pandemic. So that's that's from South Africa. Th thanks very much, Martin. Uh, interesting, Ian, about the, the, the vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities which you have there as well. And also that there's a feeling, a sense I'm getting from the discussions we've had about, about the need for change and the need to adapt and the need to, to promote change as well. Um, and that can be a positive thing as well as a, as well as a negative thing. Uh, so thanks for that. I'm going to move on. You will notice we've now been, been joined by uh, Joel Albizo, for, the Chief Executive of the American Planning Association. Joel, welcome. Um, just interesting to hear from you on the situation in the States um, and some of the, the steps that have been taken to try and face up to some of the challenges and perhaps some of the opportunities which have come out of the, the position which we're in. Sure. Well, thank you, Craig. Uh, our conversations with planning directors in the, in the U.S. and specifically the 30 biggest cities really tell us that most cities are really focused on the immediate emergency response uh, and have been over the last several months and are just now slowly kind of transitioning into what we might call recovery mode. That said, uh, some cities, and I'm thinking of Seattle, Denver, Portland, uh, have already started uh, working on approaches and strategies that that actually include um, climate change and, and green recovery considerations. But it's also important to note uh, that those cities really went going into the pandemic had a pretty strong sustainability and resilience focus. But on a broader scale, um, we're also seeing that uh, seeing some of the changes uh, over the last several months um, 
really under emergency orders, have provided some cause for optimism. There are, for example, some signs of um, what we might call a cultural shift toward green recovery, especially when it comes to transportation planning. Uh, for example, many cities uh, here are increasing their support for biking and walking. Uh, they're transforming streets in, into public space for recreation. And some are making these temporary fixes permanent. Uh, they're also really, I think, working, cities are really working to elevate the value of green space in cities. And as somebody who is a resident of the city of Chicago, I can really appreciate that personally. And not just for uh, green infrastructure uh, purposes, but really for mental and physical uh, health. Um, that said, you know, there are some countervailing forces. For example, we see that uh, vehicle miles traveled are almost back to what they were in U.S. cities before, you know, before. And, you know, we really do chalk that up a lot to uh, the effects of the pandemic. So it'll be a challenge and probably a time limited one to really try to capitalize on these shifting attitudes and behavior changes. Um, it's also been said that the pandemic has accelerated many existing trends and there's plenty of evidence for that. And one of those I think is in the area of uh, what we might call data-driven decision-making. And actually we believe that's creating uh, what I might call a tailwind that planners are beginning to capitalize on uh, in a number of cities. I'd also say and observe that um, COVID-19 and climate change um, are increasingly being recognized as being interconnected and that both of, of them, uh, in fact, widen uh, in inequity, uh, specifically um, with respect to communities of color. And planning, and certainly this is APA's position, is that uh, as both my colleagues, all three of my colleagues have said, is that uh, this idea of building back better, that re recovery strategies really should should uh, uh, focus and center in center uh, equity. Um, I think one of the major challenges that we all face, certainly we face here in the in the U.S., is to figure out how we're going to promote resilience and green recovery, considering the hit uh, that the economy has taken and specifically the huge losses that we've seen in tax revenue. I think, for example, here in the U.S., we're looking at something like a $900 billion with a B uh, loss, uh, deficit or shortfall through 2021 for state and local governments. So in summary, I would say that planning in the U.S. is primarily focused on emergency management, uh, that uh, some cultural and behavioral changes are happening as a result of the pandemic and planners are working hard to try to make them stick. And there is also an increased um, recognition of the connection between climate, health, and uh, the fundamental inequities in our society. And you know, finally, as it, it probably goes without saying, but we're going to have to be as creative as ever because you know, obviously there are fewer resources, um, so planners will have to be resourceful. But as I've come to know planners, they're an extremely um, not only optimistic, but also um, very pragmatic, creative, resourceful, and have an endless amount of grit. So I, I think planners um, will will do what needs to be done uh, uh, through recovery. Great. Thanks, Joe. Sure. I, th I think despite the challenges you've outlined there, I certainly get the sense there's some green shoots moving towards the green recover recovery there. And as you say, the uh, the profession across the world, I think, is a resilient profession, which which does face up to these needs, these challenges. Um, that's what we're about and we're about change. So I'm going to move on to, to our final um, contributor today, um, Victoria Hills, uh, Chief Executive of the Royal Town Planning Institute based in the UK. Victoria, do you want to tell us a bit about what's happening uh, across the UK um, and how uh, the Institute and um, the members have responded to that? Yeah, well, thank you very much, Craig, and delighted to join. I appreciate I've got the, the last slot of the session. However, there are a few uh, important points I'd like to make here. And and one is actually we've got a unique context in the UK because we represent uh, the UK and Ireland. We have devolved nations where planning um, operates, let's just say, slightly differently within um, devolved nations to, to perhaps how it does in England. So I've got two big points to make. And the first one 
really is applicable to those everywhere, the devolved nations. And then the second one is probably a bit more nuanced to what's going on in the English uh, English planning context at the moment. Um, and the first one is that what we've seen um, uh, across the piece, uh, across the UK, across the devolved nations, is that planners have worked incredibly hard to keep planning going. Um, yeah. We've made very clear to the, our respective governments, assemblies, parliaments, the sorts of changes that were needed quite quickly, whether that be um, the need to, uh, the ability to run planning committees online in a virtual sense, whether that be um, the extension of uh, permissions to enable development to get built out a bit later than had previously been envisaged. And I think what we've seen there is working hand in hand with governments and devolved administrations, that nobody can accuse planning of having sat still during this period of time. There's been no shutting up of shop. It's been very much about how we can keep the decisions on the road, how the planning inquiries uh, keep going through the inspectorates. And, you know, this is no mean feat, of course, to, to enable committees to run in a virtual sense in the UK required primary legislation you know, and, and the government's not entering into primary legislation very quickly um, at the best of times, but they managed to get that through quickly. So so planning and planners have been very much focused in the immediate uh, sense of how we can keep the development show on the road and be part of that sustainable green recovery. The, the second point really relates to uh, that green recovery and how uh, we now move on to the next phase of responding. And there you see slight differences across the UK in terms of how um, the devolved nations and how the UK government through its English planning policy is going to move forward. But but um, one thing they all share is the narrative of the green recovery. There may be some nuancing in the details of actually what they mean within that. But there is a genuine commitment to delivering on net zero, albeit at different times, different years, um, but there's a genuine commitment to a green recovery. And of course, the UK is hosting COP26 next year now up in Glasgow. So, you know, we, we're very much looking forward um, to that opportunity. Uh, but I think what, what the pandemic has done in the UK, and this is probably not unique to the UK, but particularly in the UK, has brought to the fore um, the inequalities that exist within people's living environments. And what we're seeing now as we move not quite into our second wave, but we've got a number of spikes is, you know, these spikes are occurring in in areas um, that may have, you know, housing issues, lack of housing, overcrowding, you know, the, these sorts of issues now have really come to the fore. We may have known them before, but it's absolutely there out in the open. And so, you know, it, it's funny we're having this conversation today. Um, those people now watching it via YouTube will know the day we recorded this uh, was the day that England published its new white paper into planning and how planning needs to respond um, to uh, the challenges that we that we have in front of us. And what we are saying now as a profession in the UK is, you know, it doesn't matter how you do it, you've got to have resources to do it really. And, you know, if you really want to have a genuine, sustainable recovery, if you really want to involve the community within that, if you really want to do plan tech, which is a UK hashtag, perhaps this is global, which is about digitising perhaps some of the back office functions, having machine readable plans, things that can be done easily and effectively in a digital sense, will require investment. Um, and we do need um, to have that investment in planning now. We can't wait for it till next year. It very much has to come now. So um, in, within the UK context, we're, in, we're entering into an interesting period of government talking about major changes to the planning system uh, in a way that we haven't seen for a long time. Um, and we're taking all of that on board whilst we're trying to keep the system running at the same time. So. Um, we are hearing lots of positive noises coming through government about investing in a sustainable green recovery. The trick now for us as a profession is to really hold their feet to the fire and, and ensure that rhetoric and that positive uh, uh, dialect or a narrative that's coming out of government is actually a reality. So we've got a lot on our plate in the UK, um, but we're ready for it. And uh, we are very much enjoying the opportunities 
some of my colleagues here have said, to share our experiences globally, to talk to each other about how we're, some of the challenges that we're having and how we're responding to those. And, you know, I think as Beth said earlier, we've never spoken so regularly as, as we're now doing. Mm. And we now know the value of this, not just in what we're doing in the day to day, but in really helping us all kind of move forward in this sense. So thank you very much. Great, Victoria. Th thanks. That's a, that's a really positive note to end on as well. Um, I, I think what we've seen over the last uh, the last few minutes is um, a really fascinating journey through planning across the world, dealing with the uh, extraordinary circumstances. Um, but facing up to the challenges, and the challenges are broadly similar across across these countries. Slightly different nuances, slightly different um, things which are priorities, and certainly, certainly certainly different ways in which there are opportunities which can be taken as well. The thing that I've taken from it is uh, one: there's a there's a real um, drive, determination to try and share how we can we can make this work across the the the, the global um, planning community, and I think GPN is a key and welcome means of doing that. And the other thing for me is that uh, from what I can gather from what you're saying, the institutes uh, and its members um, are very much up for uh, the challenge which, which is ahead of them. Uh, they're very keen to see what they can do. They want to work in a constructive way. They're coming up with innovative ideas. Um, and they want to show that planning is part of the solution and play a part in actually uh, achieving a, a post-COVID recovery, and particularly one which is a, a green recovery. So I'd, I'd just like to finish up by thanking all our contributors today. I think it's been, a, as I say, a fascinating journey. Uh, and also to thank anyone who's watching out there. Hope you'll find it useful. And maybe sometime uh, in the future we might do something similar um, where we can uh, maybe reflect back a bit more on some of the other issues which are important across the world. So thanks very much for watching and thanks very much for contributing.